Well, good afternoon. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Chancellor, Madam Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the start of the many events that are going to launch this wonderful building, The Edge. Uh, we uh, at the School of Management, I'm the Dean of the School of Management, Professor Veronica Hope Haley, we're extremely pleased that we have the first floor um, of this exciting art centre. Uh, and uh, to celebrate this and to recognise the fact that we are part of this art centre, uh, I'm starting to chair a panel debate uh, called In Conversation, which will actually look at the link between arts and the creative industries and leadership and business today. Um, you may be aware that since the financial crisis, there have been a lot of finger pointing um, at leadership uh, within business and indeed also within government. And indeed, many people are saying that we need new innovative approaches uh, to leadership development and to leadership selection that we may le learn from the mistakes of the past and not repeat those in the future. And I firmly believe that there is a great deal that we can learn from the arts and creative industries that will inform business, make business better, make business more oriented towards the needs of society. Why is that? Well, if you look at the arts, what the arts are all about is about creativity, about inspiration, about collaborating together, whether it be in an orchestra or in a play. But above all else, I think one of the things that really strikes me about the arts is that leaders in the arts inspire people towards a common purpose and a superordinate goal. Decades ago, I can remember arguing with a director from Lloyd's TSB and saying to him, but people don't get up in the morning and go to work in order to increase shareholder value. They go to actually work towards a finer goal, a bigger goal. And that's what people in the arts are constantly doing. And so it's our great pleasure to uh, work with the Arts Centre and to look at new ways of developing leaders for the future. Um, and so tonight I'm going to be chairing a, a panel of three experts who are particularly uh, um, expert in informing us in these particular areas and I'd like to uh, introduce the panel now before they each come up the way that we're going to do this is that for 30 minutes we will discuss various issues to do with leadership business and the arts in society today um, we will then open it up for 15 minutes questions and answers so please prime yourself, please get yourself ready with some absolute killer questions uh, for this panel of experts. Um, but in the meantime, let me introduce the experts one by one. Um, first of all, Margaret Heffernan. Margaret is a woman of many talents. Originally a documentary maker with the BBC, she then served as a chief executive with several corporations in the United States and has also appeared on The Secret Millionaire. Um, she now writes <coughs> extensively on management and leadership, also broadcasts and consults to some of the top corporations across the world. Reviewing one of her most recent books, the Financial Times described her as a collaborative capitalist, and the book itself a must read. Margaret is also a playwright, uh, and we are extremely proud to have her as entrepreneur in residence within the School of Management. She's an honorary graduate of the university Brilliant. and a member of the School of Management's advisory board. Margaret Heffernan. <laughs> Our next expert is drawn from a different walk of life. Sir Francis Richards has had a valued and illustrious leadership career as an army officer, chief executive of GCHQ at Cheltenham, commander in chief of Gibraltar, and now chairman of the Imperial War Museum. With very clear views about the importance that an appreciation of the arts can play in our society's growth and health, 
Sir Francis generously contributes to the life of this university and to the School of Management by sitting on its advisory board. Sir Francis. And last but not least, uh, somebody probably well known to people if you're resident in Bath, but Sir Christopher Frayling uh, has been resident in Bath for many decades, uh, used to actually work at the university, and is well known as a former chairman of the Arts Council and also of the Design Council. He's now known for his broadcasting career and his work in journalism, and only last week, in The Independent, in a pre-election piece, Sir Christopher was asked what he would do if he were Prime Minister. His answer, unsurprisingly perhaps, was to put the creative industries at the top of the agenda. Sir Christopher Frayling. <laughs> so, I'm going to kick off this debate by asking each of the panel members, in turn, to outline why you think an education incorporating the arts is critical for us today in UK society. And I'm going to start with you, Sir Christopher. Right. The arts in UK society. Well, usually, uh, in public debates, people put what I call the extrinsic arguments about the arts, that is, uh, the creative industries as an area in its own right. Tourism was very popular in the 1980s as an argument. The regional economy and all sorts of arguments like that, all of which are true. But I think it's time people started using the intrinsic arguments about the arts, which is about the arts themselves. The arts as passionate, ambiguous, exciting, uh, entertaining, giving pleasure, uh, challenging us, all these things everything that journalism and politics isn't, you know? Really complex and telling us an image of ourselves, ma uh, making order out of the chaos around us and actually telling us something about ourselves. And I think it's really strong. They do that whatever subject you're studying. And uh, I think it's a, a mistake to ghettoize those attributes to people who are studying the arts. It actually works whatever subject you're doing. And it's great there's this place they can come to to experience that. What, why do you think we've lost a sense of the importance of those areas in well, I think, Well, in my experience from the Arts Council, I mean, politicians were deeply embarrassed about being seen at arts events, um, in case the Sun uh, accused them of being eggheads. You know. um, uh, uh, going to a football match, going to Chelsea, and being photographed next to the manager, that's a different thing. Uh, and so there's this kind of upward cadence in the voice when people talk about the arts. They think that it's slightly sort of naff, particularly the intrinsic arguments, because they can be sentimental, you know, the arguments about the arts, and you don't want to be accused of being sentimental. But uh, it's very, very difficult. So you have to take a sideways step and use the sort of arguments that, uh, that the Treasury like. So it's about the economy and industry and uh, tourism and all those sorts of things, which is fine, but it is a bit reductive. That's not why we do them. We do them for all those complex reasons that I mentioned earlier, uh, as I say, to entertain, to give pleasure, to challenge, all those things. And that's a really important part of life. When we were talking earlier, well, last week, when we were talking about this debate, um, you brought up uh, the author Herbert Reed. Yes. And it would be, I think, fascinating for the, organ uh, the mm. audience to understand what Herbert right. Reed talked about. Well, there's a little book he wrote, which isn't awfully fashionable at the moment, but it was my Bible, actually, when I was uh, chairman of the Arts Council, uh, is called Education Through Art. And in it, he describes two things, education to art and education through art. Education to art is the procedures and attitudes and techniques of learning how to do art, how to actually participate in the art. Fine, we all understand that. He then talks about the things that art seems to be particularly good at bringing out in people. Resourcefulness creating your own agenda, motivation and confidence, uh, preparation for an unpredictable world, creative thinking, all these things, mm. which art, and lots of other things do that as well, but the arts are particularly good at that, and that, for him, is teaching through art. So, yes, you might want to become an artist and get good at painting or good at music, but there's this other thing going on which is equally important, and I think there isn't enough debate about exactly what is it we learn when we learn the arts, either as audience or as participants. It's quite important that 
you know, different things happen depending on whether you're actually doing art or whether you're watching art. But nevertheless, um, I, I, it's a wonderful book, and uh, uh, I'm sure there's lots of unproven assertions in it, <laughs> but they mean a lot to me. And I've seen it work. I mean, I, I'm sure everyone in the audience at school had a moment, and it's known by the educationalists as the illuminative experience or the intelligence of feeling, when an art teacher planted a seed in their mind mm. and it actually, in some ways, altered their attitude to all the other subjects. It certainly happened to me, and I think it happens to a lot of people. And so, uh, yeah, teaching through art is important. Um, it's quite interesting, the research I've been doing since the financial crisis, when I interview chief executives or senior directors, a lot of them will, and I say, you know, where does your sense of leadership come from? And often, many of them mention literature or plays or, or something that they've seen way beyond the workplace that actually inspires them. So, Francis, um, what is your view on the role of the arts in society today? Well, I think one very important bit of the role of the arts is in the reinforcement of national consciousness. I think that the things that bind us together as a nation um, are coming under a great deal of pressure. Um, things that used, we used to have in common, um, that used to be tremendous glue for society, like religion, run the risk of actually dividing us more than they unite us. Um, the arts give us common terms of reference. They are the soul of a nation to a considerable extent. And the business of developing those common terms of reference and communicating them with passion is what, is what it's all about for me. And that is what I know this centre is all about, and why I'm so glad to see it open. OK, thank you. Margaret? Well, you know, I'm an unreconstructed arts graduate and uh, proud to be one. And I spent 13 years working for the BBC making arts programming. And then I spent nearly 13 years uh, running software companies. And everyone says to me, wow, that's so strange. How did you possibly do that? You know, like it's going from, you know, from one extreme to the opposite. And we like to think these things are binary. And my personal view is actually they were exactly the same. Because in both walks of life, you have to imagine something that isn't there. You have to have the stomach to take the risk, first to imagine it and then to make it. Mm -hmm. And you absolutely have to know how to get fabulous people to work together effectively to discover the best in themselves through the work that they do. And so I didn't think there was any real difficulty about making that transition. And in fact, not being an engineer was a tremendous help to me because it meant I could ask really stupid questions. And if being the boss, of course, they had to be answered. So, um, so I think what we learn through arts is absolutely fundamental to any walk of life. Yeah. It's really interesting, you know, the Harvard Medical School, when they found that their students were proving poor diagnosticians, of course, did this typical thing. They had targets and KPIs and all this nonsense that didn't work. And then in despair, they decided to teach their students um, a course in art history, which is about how to see and at that point, they became better diagnosticians. I'm really struck by the degree to which you made reference to the economic crisis. Some of that crisis was caused and exacerbated by a spectacular failure of communication. Economists and business people and bankers who could not explain what they were doing, what they were selling, where people ended up buying things they didn't understand. And if we can't, in all walks of life, become fantastic communicators about really what are these financial products? Really what is the science of the human genome going to deliver to us? Really what kinds of decisions are we going to make about fertility or about dealing with climate change? If we can't communicate these very complex, subtle ideas in a way that doesn't dumb them down, but so that everyone in a democracy can understand them, then we'll make bad choices. Can I just add to that, just, just on that, that uh, th this phrase, the creative industries, was very, very useful in the 90s to draw attention to a particular sector of the economy. But it had one real downside, because it kind of implied that nobody else was creative. creative you know? right. And there's this rather right. narrow range of businesses mm. and industries, you know, fashion, design, uh, everything from sort of design right across to antiques via the media, et cetera, and indeed software, all those things, fine. It was a great label. 
but it really made people rather fed up who were in uh, engineering and uh, manufacturing because it implied that, you know, let's bring the artists in and parachute them in and help you to be creative. It's absolute rubbish. Uh, you know, all these activities are equal, as you rightly say, a creative approach to any of those activities is what we're really talking about rather than one particular sector of the economy. I mean, I think that's quite interesting because people mm. find it fascinating. They assume that because we work in a school of management that actually it's all about uh, number crunching and finance, and it is in part, but actually, you're, you know, when you go upstairs, I hope some of you will see. I mean, we use film, we use drama, we use role plays, we use a lot of creative activity to actually communicate mm. management and but business. It's interesting, though, that the way in which management has, over the last 10 years, started using the language of the artistic avant-garde to describe what it does. If I hear the phrase fitness for purpose, which comes yeah. from the Bauhaus, once more, yeah. uh, or you know, form follows function, blue skies thinking after Daedalus and Icarus right. you know, flying away, <laughs> create a great myth of creativity. The question is whether the language which is being used actually matches the reality. Mm -hmm. Or is there a gap between, you know, the, the businesses have certainly found a way of presenting themselves as madly right. creative by using that language, whether actually the activity has caught up with the language, I'm not sure. But the language itself, you know, our, our arts people are getting fed up because their language has been yes. completely colonized by these Get your by hands off my language. And, and, yeah, exactly, and if you use, you know, um, fitness for purpose, everyone roars with laughter now, you know. Uh, exactly. there we are. Well, that's because it's a cliche. Yeah, well, it, well, it wasn't when the Bauhaus used it. As a substitute it. for independent right. thought. Absolutely, right. but when yeah. the architects first invented it in the 1920s, it was it's revolutionary. Right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, but quite. I, it's but I think you make a really important point, yeah. which is that in the arts, you have to think for yourself. That's what being an artist is. And, you know, we're later today, we're going to hear Joanna McGregor play. She's a fantastic pianist. But that isn't just because she hits the right notes. <laughs> It's because of her thinking about what those notes mean, where they come from, how they're put together, what are the patterns, what does it mean to her, what could it mean to us. That's thinking for yourself. And if you want to look at the major institutional failures that we've seen over the last 20 years, that's been ter perpetrated by what William Dereshevich calls excellent sheep. You know, re people who are really good at not thinking for themselves. Uh, not cheap, but sheep. Sheep. Oh, right. sheep. Okay, very no, right. no, yeah. sheep. And so, <laughs> Certainly you know, not cheap. Fun <laughs> fundamental, I think, to the health of a culture is the ability to think for yourself and to be able to articulate that mm -hmm. and to be able to share that vision with other people who will and can make it better for you. But it's, it's quite a thin line, isn't it, between sheep and people who are just completely anarchic or out for their own. I mean, the, how do you... The anarchy is such a small things? problem. You know, we have a much bigger problem with the sheep than we have with the anarchists. <laughs> and in any case, <laughs> in any <laughs> case, uh, the idea that art is automatically sort of anarchic, I, I, right. I slightly take issue. There's a very good example of this. You remember, uh, on Alan Sugar's The Apprentice, uh, the last oh, yeah, series absolutely. but one, he had a design challenge, and it was to design a brand of dog food and try and sell it to all these retailers, the idea of it. And the moment he mentioned the word design, out came the flip chart, out came the coloured pencils, they took off their jackets, took off their uh, ties, and got all creative. Mm. No analysis of the brief, no, no consideration of whether they wanted the product or what it should look like. It's, it's a mistake to see the arts as completely right. anarchic. There are also disciplines, important right. disciplines, and constraints within the arts, and that's part of the excitement, is working within them. Right. So I, I wouldn't say it's anarchy at one I, end and uh, sheep yeah. at the other. It's, I really uh, wouldn't want to yeah. suggest you were an anarchist in any way. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very kind. <laughs> Please forgive me. If you, but but um, moving on from that, I mean, what is there, therefore, from your experience of military leadership, Sir Francis, that, you know, you've heard Margaret talk and Sir Christopher mm -hmm. talk. What is there in terms of military leadership that can be uh, enhanced by some understanding of the art? Of the art. Well, I mean, there are all sorts of elements to leadership, but I mean, three that strike me immediately, communication, inspiration, and the ability to take risks sensibly. And that is what the arts are about, especially the third, um, the taking of risks, um, using your judgment, backing it, carrying people with you, and communicating whatever it is that has excited you and made you think this is a risk mm -hmm. worth taking getting them to follow you. And so, I mean, these are very similar skills. I mean, the direct transfer of the arts into things like military leadership is less obvious. 
um, great leaders obviously draw on literary resources. I mean, look at everyone from Winston Churchill to Tim Collins. Um, a very obvious sort of classical references in, in, in their rhetoric. Um, and I, I did incidentally once know an American general who had, had a degree in theater studies. And at his farewell parade, um, he so arranged things that at the end, there was an enormous explosion on the stage, and when the smoke had cleared, he was gone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure that is a typical example of how one uses the arts in, in military leadership. But I do think there are less, less obvious ways. I mean, I think that the way that the arts are used to show respect for the armed forces, uh, remembrance, um, the use of art at the National Memorial Arboretum, for example, um, the use of music, you will have seen everything from the didgeridoo to the Westminster Cathedral Choir at the Anzac Memorial the other day. Um, all of that matters enormously um, in terms of military. And all your great galleries at the War Museum. Yes. Absolutely. All Generations of, of artists. All of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's something else which is, I don't know, and Sir Francis would know better than I do, I don't know if the idea of leadership as heroic soloist was ever real but I am quite confident that it won't work now. That the world we inhabit moves too fast, it's too complex, there's too much information, and it isn't possible for one single person at the top of the pyramid to know so much, to see so perfectly, that they alone can call the shots. In fact, when we've seen institutions where that's happened, those institutions have failed pretty spectacularly. And so what we're seeing is a very subtle shift to a much more collective form of leadership, which requires high degrees of collaborative skill and talent. And I can think of no better way to learn that, to learn the give and take, to learn how to be tuned in to other people, to learn how to think from different perspectives. I can think of no other way to learn that than the arts. And I think you know, we're going to have to make this shift because we simply don't have the people with you know, gigantic IQs who can make the shot, call the shots in isolation. So we need outstanding collaborators who will draw on the talents of everybody around them mm -hmm. to good effect. And, and can I just on that, the, the, um, uh, I mentioned in that independent article that you were kind enough to quote that Roosevelt in 1936 and Maynard Keynes in 1945 realized that it is precisely during a deep recession that one should support the arts wholeheartedly rather than reducing them. National morale, image, Pride. Uh, et cetera, um, international reputation, which had taken a dent with America in the 30s, and, and right. uh, Keynes was worried about the, the 40s in England. Um, all these things uh, reminding us of why we fought in the first place reminding us uh, about a country that's worth living in for more than tax reasons. Right. All those questions, which Roosevelt reckoned, so you get the Works Progress Administration and the American government has never put so much money into the arts mm. as it did in the middle of the Depression. Mm. And Keynes said the same thing in 1945, which was the foundation of the Arts Council. Mm. And that's a real lesson, and it supports what you're saying, that that is precisely the moment to put a real backing into the arts mm. and try and you know, use them in the way that you've described. Unfortunately, the lesson doesn't seem to be being learned. No. So, well, let me ask you then. So if we had David Cameron <laughs> in the audience, which we don't have, no, no, quite, yeah. but um, given you know, the results of the election, I mean, what would you say to this incoming government about how they should focus, how they should prioritise? Well, I mean, I mean if, if I was talking to a Treasury official, as I say, I'd talk about the importance of the creative industries, which are only... Um, two points below manufacturing in contributors to GDP and, uh, uh, and only just below the financial services, but you wouldn't know that right. from publicity because they're not awfully good at lobbying, so you've got to make the economic argument. There's tourism. Why do people come to England in their droves? Why do they come to Bath? Why do they go to Stratford-on-Avon? The arts, you know, and, and that's, that's an argument the Treasury likes. If I was talking to my colleagues in the arts, I'd try and put the argument for the intrinsic uh, value of the arts. But, but I think it's only the instrumental arguments that really cut ice when you've got to make decisions about priorities. You know, mm. uh, Is it hospitals? Is it the arts? You have to use the pragmatic arguments. I'm afraid that's how it is. And I, I spent my life doing it for six years. You, it trips off the tongue after a time. You, know, you get used to it. But, uh, uh, but the creative industry, people still don't quite understand it. They, they think it's all styling. 
icing on the cake. I mean, we're talking about the software industry, the gaming industry. They all come under that category. They're really important contributors to our economy right. now. Okay, so Francis, what, your letter to the Prime Minister, what would it say? Well, I would certainly, everything Christopher said is absolutely right. But I think I would also say that it is a terrible mistake to value any of the things onto which you can pin a price tag. Um, look at the mistakes that were made during the Scottish referendum campaign when everything was reduced to how much better off Scotland might or might not be mm. when independent. There was no heart and soul put into that. And I think the, the nurturing of the arts, particularly the arts outside London, um, it's a great mistake to focus only on excellence within the capital. I mean, you will have seen Brian Appleyard's yep. piece in the yep. Sunday Times yeah, no, he's right. uh, yesterday. Mm. He is right. And we need, yes, to be spending more on the arts. We're facing very substantial cuts mm. in the arts and museums sector um, in the next few years. We've faced um, already um, our grants in aid in museums have gone down by, by about 30% um, in the last five years. Um, they look set to go down um, a good deal more over the next few years. And we've reached the point at which the maintenance of the no admission charges to museums, which is pretty important, um, it's there in party man manifestos, but who is paying for it? Mm. Mm. Um, the economies that can be made have been made already. Mm. Um, it, it is time for a little bit more. Do you, do you know how much the arts cost, is it? 17p, <laughs> if you take uh, per capita in the country, 17p per person per week. That's less than half a pint of milk. That's what the arts cost. Mm. It's, the Treasury calls these figures sweepings. That's the phrase for it. It's the small change. Mm. It's half a billion over, over the piece, but that's to them small change. Yeah. It's not as if we're fighting over huge amounts of money. Tiny investments have huge responses in the arts. You know. Sorry, I interrupted you. But. No, no Chris, but I think there's another point too, because I mean, if it were up to me, I'd say please stop melting down the family silver, because we're not even selling it. We're just mm. getting rid of it. <laughs> You know, if you think of what the cuts to the BBC's World Service has done to Britain standing mm. in the world, mm. it's, reputation, it's horrific. Mm. It's probably the single most destructive thing we've done to this country's <laughs> reputation. If you think about all the fantastic actors and actresses, sorry, though I know they're all supposed to be called actors these days, but if you think about all these actors that are routinely getting Emmys and Oscars and Grammys and all this stuff, almost all of those people came out of subsidized weekly rep in the 1950s and 1960s. I don't know who's going to succeed them because they're not getting that kind of exposure and training. The playwrights that were nurtured then are finding it virtually impossible to make a living. You know, the things that people around the world truly cherish Britain for, we are not funding anymore. We stopped funding it a long time ago. And we have this sort of pious hope that it will continue, mm -hmm. but it's an irrational hope. But it is what makes people feel incredibly proud of this country. So here we are in the University of Bath, uh, in this wonderful new arts centre with its leadership development. Just a quick word from each of you uh, before we finish on what your hopes are for this wonderful building and this wonderful creative space. Margaret. Well, um, I have a, a sort of mantra, fun disables fear that when you're having fun, you, you think more widely and more creatively. So I hope that the fun that takes place in this building stops people being fearful sheep and helps them to think for themselves and to discover how much more talent they have inside them than they've ever seen before. Thank you. Sir Francis. I hope it'll stop people thinking in boxes. <laughs> think people thinking, this man is a scientist this woman is a management expert, this man or woman is an artist. Um, all of those disciplines need to enrich each other, and this building seems to me to be dedicated to that proposition, and I think it's terrific. Thank you. Sir Christopher. Yes, I've, uh, I'd like to quote a poem, if I might, because uh, this building is called The Age, and it's a poem by Christopher Logue, in answer to your question, written in the 60s about the French writer Apollinaire. It's very short, you'll be glad to hear. Come to the edge, we might fall. Mm -hmm. Come to the edge, it's too high. Come to the edge. And they came, and he pushed, and they flew. That's what this place is for, I think. Fantastic.
it's funny what you said about the <laughs> quoting the poem. There's a famous favorite poem of mine by the Irish poet John Montague, the last line of which is, "On the edge is best." Ah, oh, well, there we so. are. Should be written over the door. Yeah. <laughs> so Etch, not... etched, of course. <laughs> So that was a fantastic uh, discussion. Thank you very much, the three of you. And now we're going to open it up for questions uh, from uh, our guests. We have two roving mics uh, being carried by people. Um, so could we please have a question for our panel? Ah, down here. And uh, well, perhaps, Will, if you come down for this one and then that gentleman afterwards. It's this gentleman in the middle, Will. Well, thank you all very much for your, uh, for your contributions. As a parent of children who are drawn to careers in the arts, uh, I wondered how you might respond to their friends who are worried that they may be taking a soft option. <laughs> oh. 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 Oh, boy, is it so not soft. No, absolutely. I mean, I have to say, I think... It's one of the hardest careers you can imagine. It's interesting, among other things, I've had the enormous pleasure to sit on the board of RADA. And it's quite interesting because the board is sort of half business people and half alumni. So Alan Rickman, Fiona Shaw, Mike Lee, all these fantastic people. And it's quite interesting because the business people have huge respect for the artists. And as a consequence, they hardly ever say anything because they're afraid <laughs> of upsetting the artist because they think the artists are really delicate and couldn't possibly cope. And at one point I took them and I saw outside and I said, you have to understand, these people do hard things every day. Every piece of their livelihood is without security or guarantee. These are tougher people than you will meet in any commercial walk of life. At which point we started having really great conversations. <laughs> So I think the arts, far from being the soft option, I think it's really scary. I mean, I would say to kids in the arts, you know, whatever happens, just don't look down. Mm. It depends <laughs> Keep on the going arts, you know. and don't look down. I mean, the thousands of hours that go into the deep learning of a dancer or a painter yeah. or a musician, you know, are huge. And people don't, there's a book by a man called Richard Sennett called The Craftsman, which looks, which came out recently, it's in Penguin, which looks at the sheer number of hours. There was a thing on telly last week in this evening that was devoted to slow TV, yes. where they had these crafts, yeah. and they had a bladesmith making a, a knife in Sheffield and a glass blower, and they had, uh, the only caption was first hour, second hour, 16th hour, 19th hour, 21st hour, and you realize the sheer effort that went into this very commonplace object, a kitchen knife. It's, it's tough, but very, very rewarding. Uh, and so it's not a soft option. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, your children should tell, tell their colleagues to watch TV. <laughs> Some things on TV. Sir Francis. <laughs> I'd say um, it's for you to ask them the question, not are you doing something challenging enough, but are you actually determined enough and tough enough yeah. to take this on? Um, and the gentleman uh, at the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps so yeah, it's working. Thank you very much. Perhaps you'd also like to introduce yourself and say uh, okay. who you are. Um, my name's Tim Lancaster. Uh, delighted to be here today. Um, thank you very much, panel members. Um, you've, of course, rightly explained that the arts are fantastically important for the good life for our society as we become... Uh, as consumer goods become more and more available, we need other things, and the, the arts provide that, but also incredibly important for our whole society, for the economy, etc. And yet during the election campaign, I didn't hear a single politician mention the arts once. Yeah. Um, how can we get politicians to take on the arts? Um, I worked in the Treasury for 20 years, and frankly, with respect to Sir Christopher, I don't think the instrumental argument works. Um, it's just another subsidy, and the Treasury hates subsidies. Yeah. I think we've got to change the conversation and emphasize the intrinsic yeah. importance of the yeah, arts no, and persuade politicians not to be embarrassed. They're embarrassed by God. They're embarrassed by lots of things. Can we stop them being embarrassed by the arts and embrace the arts? I'd be interested in your views. No, I mean, that's a huge question and, and a really important <laughs> one. No, nobody did mention the arts. Or indeed, the, the cre uh, one of the things I said in this article was the creative industries, even, as a phrase, has dropped out of political discourse lately. 
You know, in the 90s, everyone was using it, and it seemed the new kid on the block, and everyone seemed to understand what it was. But it's gone. Uh, the only creative thing that seemed to come through in the election was, was accounting, actually. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, the, um, but how do you do it? It's interesting. If you have a senior diplomatic visitor to London, they tend to get taken to Covent Garden. So at that level, soft power, mm. diplomacy, those sort of things, or indeed an exhibition uh, at the Royal Academy about uh, Turkish art, Greek art, whatever, they've become political events, Chinese art, the Terracotta Army. The openings are political events now about soft power. So at that level, at the diplomatic level, world service, etc., everybody understands that. It's at the day-to-day -day level, they seem embarrassed to be associated with the arts, as I was saying, as if they'll, people will think they're eggheads, or in some strange way, soft, you know? Well, and I, and I don't know how we get over that. But I, don't I know think how we get also, over that. the arts look like they're fun. And of course, they can be fun, yeah. although you know, they take all that hard work. Yeah. But I think people tend to trivialize them, partly because sometimes it's the same thing that they do for hobbies, yeah. and also because it looks like fun. And somehow, we have still this rather Puritan ethos, which says, if it's serious yeah. and important, yeah. it's not fun. It should be grim and miserable. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is, a, I think... You I, know, can, I can tell of a lot of art that's grim and miserable. Yeah, exactly. Want, but, you know. Exactly. So maybe we need to present the arts as more grim and miserable, and then they'll get more respect. <laughs> yeah, but football's OK. Yeah. Okay. Football's OK, you see. We've, we've got people bursting to ask questions mm. here. Um, now, I think we've got... I think it's John Cullum, isn't it? Uh, oh. So, uh, and then we'll go to the gentleman behind him. Oh, we're going to... We're not going to rove the mics. We're going to pass the mics. Mm. Okay, and then and then I see you, I see you at the back. Gosh, it's like being Forest David Gimbledy, isn't it? So yeah. we're, we're going we're going yeah. in that way. So yeah. John. Yes, thank you, um, John. I'm chairman of the Bath Festivals, and um, to the gentleman in the front, I have two uh, family members who did make it in the arts, just about. Um, <laughs> we've learned that um, you, you've talked about the steady reduction in public funding, be it from the government, local authority, the Arts Council of England. There seems to be a progressive downward trend. So the arts are going to have to look for patrons, to corporates in particular, to um, refund the difference. Now, the School of Management, as I understand it, is going to draw on the arts to develop leaders of the future in the business world. Can we expect mm. reciprocal arrangements that those business leaders in the future will give back to the arts? Will they be encouraged so to do? Gosh, that's very, that's very interesting. Isn't okay, it? let's collect another question before we put it to the panel. If it goes behind you, and yes, it's like a chessboard. Let's mm -hmm. just have your question as well, and then we'll look at, mm. and perhaps this lady's at the back in a moment, and then we'll answer all three in one go. So please, Jen, sir, who are you, and where are you from, and welcome. Mm. Hello, um, I'm local to this wonderful city, um, and I'm designer in residence on the fashion course for BA, fashion design. My question is, it's sort of also an observation. Um, I've been working on the Fashion BA course for five years now. Um, I started when I was 24. And um, something I've noticed in the last five years is that the students are becoming increasingly fearful of the future. Um, they're fearful of what's going to happen next. And I see that as an opportunity as a designer myself. I love that challenge of that. But for them, they're terrified, and they, they are focused on the mark. They're focused on what they have to do to get the percentage in order to get the degree. But I never graduated. So when I tell them I didn't graduate, they look at me with a blank <coughs> face. My observation is what has got to change to give the youth the freedom that maybe you had when you were at school that you can do whatever you want to do and you can because these guys they are just they're really scared and it's preventing okay. them from being free great well we'll 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 hold that one and then we'll just take the ladies at the back thank you so i hope you're storing Gosh. these three and you can <laughs> answer which one you want one. yes please um hello i'm also from bath festivals i'm belinda kidd the chief executive of bath festivals but my question was about the, I don't feel that uh, when we're making the case for the arts, I completely agree we don't talk enough about the intrinsic value. And one area we particularly don't talk about is the really significant impact that the arts can have on young people, particularly young people who are alienated and disenfranchised from society. I mean, moving away from, I mean, within Bath, Bath Festival's done some fantastic work in schools in terms of really building what we've called the, the invisible, the, the, truant, the truants of the mind, the people who are there 
but their minds are not in school. And we've done a lot to help build their communication skills. And when I worked in North Staffordshire in the Potteries, we were, the theatre I was were involved with, the New Vic, did some amazing work going, working with young people who were offend, young offenders mm -hmm. and sort of really getting them to understand the emotional impact that their crimes were having on their victims using drama. And I think I don't hear that argument very often in terms of the case being made for the arts, no, and I would be interested to... No, it's interesting. OK, yes. so let, let me open it up to our three experts. Can I, on, on that last issue, just briefly, I mean, one of the things I'm most proud of, of my watch on the Arts Council, was a TV series called Ballet Who, which is all about taking, some of you may have seen it, a group of young offenders, I mean, absolute no-hopers, who'd had no advantages in life at all, and introducing them to Birmingham Royal Ballet, where they worked with the cast, mm -hmm. teamwork, all the things that you've described. And they'd never actually worked in a, in a sort of a generous, spirited teamwork way in their lives before. They were out for number one. And it was the most, mo the, the final thing was a performance of Romeo and Juliet. We kind of figured Romeo and Juliet, you know, drugs, gang warfare, <laughs> it's got everything. And it was the perfect, uh, uh, you know, thing to do, Prokofiev. And uh, several have stayed in the ballet world. So it wasn't as if one lost interest, you know, the moment, the, but the performance was one of the most moving things I've ever been to because here were people who knew nothing about dance mm. and after a, prolong, a total immersion in the work of the dance company, they actually were able to perform on stage and I think it's transformed their lives. So I think that sort of thing is very, very important. Can I just add, um, my wife once made a film about a theatre group among young, deprived people. Um, it, and somebody broke into the theatre to steal the electric kettle, gathered what was going on, and stayed. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up working in, in, in the performing arts. Um, the, it's a tremendously powerful thing, and yes, we must find ways. And I think uh, there's a huge responsibility on everybody working in the arts, not just to say, man, there's no money. We have to find ways to use whatever we have to reach out to people such as you describe. So mm. tremendous mm. potential for inclusion and indeed yeah. what you were referring to earlier, Sir Francis, cohesion and identity, mm -hmm. but particularly I think at the moment inclusion. Margaret. Um, I think in response to, to John Cullen's question, I very much hope that what's happening in this building, which is to do about the collaboration and intersection of arts and business, absolutely will make the people who are business students now and we hope be business leaders in the future appreciate where their skills and talents were really developed. I think, you know, Sir Francis talked about getting people out of these very polarized boxes. And I think that's right. I think we have to stop thinking, you know, that there's the sort of science and engineering over here and the arts over here and they don't relate to each other. I think they relate to each other quite profoundly, and to the degree that we can give students from one discipline the experience of the other, I think they'll end up with a great deal more respect for each other. You know, I'm also very struck that, um, you know, I write a lot about um, science and scientists and very, very creative science labs. One of the, the most creative of these at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, I asked the lab chief, Uri Alon, you know, how did he learn to manage his people so well, and his answer was he did improv theater. Mm. You know, now that blending of talents is really, really inspiring. And to the question about fearful students, I can tell you that those fearful students become fearful employees, become fearful executives, and some of them become fearful chief executives. And the regime that we currently are enforcing in education, which is for every question, there is a right answer and a million wrong answers, mm. and your job is simply learn the right answer, I think is destructive beyond belief. And what you do about it, I don't know, but I find myself amazed as a parent to be on the phone to my son at university trying to persuade him, I can't believe I'm doing this, trying to persuade him that the grades don't matter. You know, that he's either doing it for himself or he's wasting his time and money. Well, my, his time and my money. Right? <laughs> yeah. But I really think, you know, you have to find something in your education that's for you. Otherwise, you're wasting a phenomenal opportunity. Yes. I mean, taking the point about business, business and the art, 
I, I think you know that the, the the British approach to uh, the the sort of co-funding of the arts is actually uh, quite invigorating for both parties when it's at its best. You know, in America, most of the money that goes into the arts is now corporate, and the result is you get endless performances of La Boheme. You know, yeah, that's the thing. Swan Lake. Uh, and on the other side, in the continent of Europe, it's nearly all state money. We have this mixed economy approach, which is unique, actually, to Britain, which is, for example, in most performing arts companies, a third of the money they get is from the state through the Arts Council, a third is from box office, and a third is from merchandising and sponsorship. So we've got this mixed... People think, you know, the grant is everything. Mm. Those days went in the 70s yeah. when, when it was... It was uh, it's now a seed corn, a catalyst. But you need that seed corn in order to persuade everybody else. I mean, if the state isn't prepared to invest in the RSC, nobody else is. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. So it, this idea of a mixed economy, people are frightened of it, but I think it's, it's actually very invigorating. So if we can, you know, sow that into your management people, that part of their role is to be that one-third... Mm. And, uh, and think creatively about how you do that and what you expect in return, all of that, then I and think... And one uh, reason to make business. money is to give it away. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm, I'm afraid... I know there are a number of you bursting to ask questions. Golly, um, and uh, I'm afraid we've actually run out of time. I'm sure we could, could go on for, for many, many more minutes. Um, suffice it to say, John, what I say to our students is that they've had a privileged education, they've had, they're going to have a privileged career, but they owe a responsibility back into society that comes with privilege. So that's my answer to you. <laughs> um, but uh, now we have a whole series of excellent uh, events lined up for you. We hope you're going to have a, a, a look around the edge. But in the meantime, can I ask you once more to thank our expert panel for their wonderful contribution. Thank you very much.